Isn't he? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he marvelous? We've gathered here today. Yeah, that, it's worth it. It's worth getting excited about Jesus. You know, for us, a lot of times, I know we're polite church folk from the South, and sometimes we think that you just show up because that's what you're supposed to do, but Sundays remind us that we gather on the first day of the week to commemorate the truth that Jesus is alive. We got plenty of stuff to do, more than we can get to. We didn't come here because we needed one more thing to fill up our calendar. We didn't come here just because we need others to think that we're, we've got it together. We didn't come here because it's the regular rhythm. We came here because we're broken and weak and needy people who have a hope that is steadfast and sure, a king in Jesus. And so whether you are a guest or you're a regular here, we just bid you welcome. We have come to make much of Jesus. So if you're here, you're an atheist, an agnostic, a skeptic, a faithful follower, backslidden, or just somewhere in the gaps, we're glad that you've come to celebrate with us today. At the Orchard Church, we wanna welcome you, and we want you to know Jesus makes all the difference. So this morning, if you got your Bibles, I wanna invite you to the Newer Testament. You can turn toward the end. We're gonna be in the book of 1 John, uh, chapter two, and today we'll begin in verse number 28. We are in a series called Identity. Now, for us, it seems that there is an identity crisis all around us. It seems that we are in an identity crisis as a nation. We're an identity crisis as to what our leaders should be and what they should be like. We're an identity crisis when it comes to gender and sexuality. We're an identity crisis as far as globalization, as far as our relationships to others. It seems that for many people, we are seeking to figure out just who we are. But in this series, we are talking about what the scripture has to say to us about our identity as Christians. What does the Bible say about us when it comes to understanding our identity in Christ? What are the words and relationships that help us to understand what it means to follow Jesus and to be a Christian? So today, we're going to be looking at the identity of child. What does it mean that we are God's children now and forever? Now, there is a certain sense in which we will talk about God being the father of all and the the brotherhood and sisterhood of all mankind. And if we speak in terms of family with that sort of metaphor and we just want to honor people because they are the image bearers of God and treat them with respect and dignity, that is good. But what we're talking about today needs a little bit of a category distinction. We're not talking about the sea of humanity and and, and that sort of relationship as creation, but we are talking specifically about those who have repented of their sin, placed their faith and hope in Jesus Christ, have been adopted as sons and daughters of the living God. What does it mean to be a child of God, not in a creation sense, but what does it have to be mean to be a child of God in the recreated, the reborn, born again? in the sense that we have been rescued from sin and death. The old, there is a pastor, African-American pastor named Evie Hill. And Evie Hill had hired a young woman to be his secretary. And one of his friends came by one day and said, Evie, do you know who your secretary is? He said, oh yeah, I knew who my secretary is. Her name's Natalie. She does a great job. I'm so pleased to have her. He said, no, no, no. Do you understand who Natalie is? Well, Yeah. She's a young woman who helps me with some of the tasks around here. She's doing a good job, so I pay her $2 an hour. He says, but do you know that Natalie Cole is Nat King Cole's daughter? He was stunned. He called Natalie to his office. He says, Natalie, is your dad Nat, was your dad Nat King Cole? She said, yeah. He said, why didn't you tell me? She said, I didn't know it was required for the job. He said, it's, it's not. I didn't even know, what, what's the deal? She said, well, yeah, my, that's my dad, and he's left something for me, but I won't come into it until I am 21 years old. Today, I want us to see what it means to be able to say that God is our Father, and although we have not come into the fullness of all that means just yet, there is a unique and special and wondrous thing for us as Christians to be the children of God. 
So we're in the book of 1 John, and John doesn't um, actually identify himself in this book, but there are a lot of good church traditions that point to the fact that John was the author of this. And so we're going to pick up in chapter 2, verse number 28 this morning. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse number 28. The Bible says this, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. May God bless the reading of his word. Receive this living word from God himself. We've reached a transition point. In this letter that you'll notice at the very beginning of verse 28, when you read the Bible and you see phrases like, and now, you need to make sure that you knew what came before the and now. So I'll come in to you for your homework. You can read chapter one and you can catch up to that this afternoon before your eyes drift off into slumber with the pitter patter of rain. And so we're at a transition point, and John is writing, and as we think about John, we got to make sure that we have our distinction here. We talk about John, we're not talking about John the Baptist here, we're talking about John the Beloved. And as we're talking about John's identity, we need to see the ways that Christ's transforming power had been at work in him, because John was also known by some other names. He went by his wrestling name. The Son of Thunder. I'm quite sure this tag team on pay-per-view on Saturday night, the Sons of Thunder, would have done great. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 20. He had a brother named James, and James and John were the Sons of Thunder, and I just have all kinds of ridiculous notions in my head about that right now. He's one of the inner three, Peter, James, and John, uh, having firsthand witness and knowledge to things like the transfiguration of the Christ. And as he is writing here, it's important for us to remember that this one called the beloved, this one who speaks with such paternal tenderness, that his identity astounded even him as he ponders. And, and he wants us to know, and now, as we make this transition, he wants us to understand what it means to be a child of God. C.S. Lewis wrote in the Screw Tape Letters, if you're not familiar with that, Screw Tape is the name of an older demon who was training a younger demon named Wormwood in how to guide human beings into hell. And he makes the comment as he's training him, he warns him that his task is difficult. And he says, the reason it's difficult is because our enemy, speaking of God himself, has a curious fantasy of making all these disgusting little human vermin into sons. You see, this morning, what I want us to see is the incredible truth that for those who have repented of their sin, have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, they are made the children of God. And it is a wonderful and marvelous thing that transforms the way that we relate to God, the way that we relate to each other, and the way that we relate to the world. So as we walk through this text, you can think of it in basically three categories. What we are, what we will be, and what we should be. And so as John makes this transition and he begins to walk us through this, he says, and now little children abide in him. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to consider this morning. He calls this letter to these churches, he calls them little children. I have a question for those of you, especially if you've been following Christ for any number of years, who are your children in the faith? You see, as followers of Jesus, our divine commission is that we are supposed to go and make disciples. And what that means is we should make disciples in our own homes and certainly with our children that are in our home, be they adoptive or step or biological, we ought to make disciples there. But who are the extended children that you have as a disciple maker? 
Who are the children who are walking in faith that you check on regularly? Who are those that you have had the privilege of seeing them begotten into the kingdom of God and then teaching them to observe all things that Christ has commanded them? John speaks, and he speaks so warmly and tenderly. He speaks of these children. Oh, my children, who is it that you are discipling? I want you to know everyone's being discipled. The issue is not not whether somebody is a disciple or not. Everyone's being discipled. It's really a question of who is discipling them. Parents, for those in your home, who's discipling your children? You may rest assured that their companions at school are doing everything they can to disciple them. Probably not in good ways, or at least in mature ways. You can rest assured that Netflix and Hulu are discipling them. You can rest assured that the radio is discipling them, that social media is discipling them. When it comes to children in the faith, my question for those of you who have been in Christ for a long time, who are the children that you're walking with? John speaks and he, and he says, and now little children. He's speaking in terms of those that he has been able to father in the faith. And he tells them, I want you to abide in Christ. Now, for those of you who enjoy a good word study, I want you to know he uses the, ter- the word abide in chapter two 10 times in 1 John chapter two. 10 times. You think he's trying to make a point to us? He, he talks about abiding in Christ. In, in his gospel in chapter 15, this idea of abiding, we don't use the word abiding a whole lot anymore. But this is the idea of remaining, dwelling, making your home in. And so he's saying, listen, I I want you children, I want you to make your home in Jesus. That should be the place where your identity is wrapped up. Your life is hidden with Christ in God, Colossians tells us. When it comes to your identity, I want you to know, children, you gotta make your home in Jesus. You see it often and regularly, and for some of you, depending on your job or your vocation, you may have been a family that had to move several times, and you learned early on that really home is wherever, well, at my house, it's wherever mama is, right? Home is where those people are, and so for us as followers of Jesus, home is with Jesus. And so John says, listen, I I want you children to abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. There there is on, on average about one every 25 verses, the New Testament mentions the second coming of Christ. Now for us, we don't often talk about the second coming of Christ. Now we'll regularly, at least on an annual basis, when it comes time for Christmas, we will talk about his first advent and we will go and we will think on that. But sometimes we don't talk a whole lot about the fact that he is going to return. And yet it is mentioned so many times, more than 250 times in just under 400 chapters, it's mentioned over and over and over that Christ is going to return and his second return will not be like the first. It will not be under cover of a stable on the outskirts of town in meager circumstances. He will come and every eye will see this conquering king when he returns. And John says, listen, I want you to have confidence so that you're not shrinking back in shame. It's kind of like, you know, on a Saturday morning, let's just hypothetically say, you didn't have anywhere you had to be. You didn't, the kids didn't have to be anywhere. So you wake up, you get to sleep a little bit late. Praise the Lord. You got a little bit of the five o'clock shadow still on your face. We won't talk about your breath. You're in those jammies that you have kept for way too long. You're wearing a bathrobe that smells like it was washed in 1978 for the last time. You're strolling around in the house having a great time. You're on your second cup of coffee when the doorbell rings. Now I know in this culture, what you do is you go into the plan that you have already worked out with all the children. Everybody be quiet and hit the deck. (laughs) Nobody speak, turn the TV off, right? We're gonna pretend like we're not at home. You you guys know the plan and we go and do that, you know, and you're there because there was a day when there was an expectation, you know, that you had to open your door all the time and now we're just like, "Mm mm-mm, let's all hide. We'll just communicate via the keyboard and I'll text you later, right? But imagine, if you will, 
You go to the door, and it's someone that you really care for. You haven't seen them. You knew they were coming. You didn't know exactly it was that day, and you appear that way. My fear is that for a lot of us in the Christian life, with no expectation of Christ's imminent return, that that is how we live. Very little care or concern for the way that we speak or act, the things that we indulge in, the way that we feed our minds. Instead, we're content just to be comfortable and it to be about us getting to do what we want to and the confines of what is ours and the way that we want to do it. When Scripture says, listen, there is an imminent return for the coming king. If, there, if these were last days in the first century, then how imminent is his return now? And for us, we're so caught up and we have so many things going on and the to-do list is never exhausted. And as we work through it, it's as if the Jesus' return is just this thing that we talk about every once in a while. We want to fascinate ourselves with calendars and blood moons and whatever else is coming around the corner. John says, listen, children, I, I want you to know the big deal is you got to make your home in him. And I want you to be confident. I don't want you to be shrinking back in shame when he is coming very soon. And he goes and he says, listen, I, I, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. That's verse 29. You see, there is this place, and I, and I want you to know, this is one of those places where I tread lightly and have to be very careful because I don't want us to get the gospel backwards here. You see, in the good old South and really just all around us in the world, there is this false gospel of morality that somehow if we adhere to a certain set of behaviors, we will have saved our souls by the careful way that we have lived. But the problem is that's not what the Bible teaches. We conform to a morality that society says this is acceptable and good. We learn it when we are children. We know kind of what pleases our parents and our teachers. And we try not to get too far off the track one way or another. And we try to just be good people who love their families and work hard and try to pay some of their taxes and occasionally do good things for somewhere in town. And we think that somehow that saves us. But I want you not to get the gospel backwards here. You see, the grounds for your righteous living, John tells us at the end of that verse, is the fact that you have been born again in him. You see, your good deeds never could save you. They never will save you. And whereas we love to embrace Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, but we don't go on because we are his workmanship, his poema, his work of art. We were created, recreated, brand new creatures, as Pastor Sam told us, in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now, Jesus doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. And when it comes to those good works, it's not your good works that save you. He already told us that. You're saved by grace. It's not of works, but those good works are the evidence that we belong to him. You see, we live in a culture where a lot of times, you know, you can either just, you do the christening thing or the catechism, the confirmation thing or the baptism thing. You filled out the card, you cried at youth camp or VBS, and then it's just like a free-for-all until you get to heaven. But that's not what the Bible teaches you see, the, the evidence of grace in your life, the demonstration of the Spirit's transforming power is borne out over time as the fruit of righteousness is demonstrated to those around you. An increasing love for God, an increasing love for his word, an increasing love for his people, increasing victory over temptation and sin, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, in increasing measure, not perfectly, but increasing because... As Paul told us in Philippians 1, I'm confident Jesus will finish his good work in you. You see, if your salvation is dependent upon a christening or a confirmation or a filled out card or a baptism, then we're missing what scripture teaches about salvation. John is saying, listen, if you're in Christ, oh beloved little children, if you're in Christ, you make your home and you practice righteousness because he's your home and you love him. For a lot of people, and this is myself, we try to fight sin by we're just going to try harder. I'm going to do more. You know what? I can beat this sin. 
I'm going to just, I, I, all right, I know what I'm going to do. I got on the interwebs and the Google machine tells me here's five steps to a better you and a better this and a better that, victory over this. And so I'm going to just do that. The problem is if you could have ever saved yourself by the strength of your own hands, then Christ came and died in vain. We never could save ourselves. We can't save ourselves now. Let us not get the gospel backwards. This living in the fruit of righteousness being born in our lives is the result of having been born again in Christ. Not we've earned that salvation by the strength of our hands and comparatively speaking, doing better than those around us. John says, listen, you gotta make your home in Jesus. That's, that's where this deal is, and you gotta be born again. And then because he's righteous and he's conforming you to his image, the grounds for your sanctification, your righteous living come from his work in you. It's the demonstration that he's in you. He wants them to practice righteousness, not to earn salvation, because the victory over sin comes through our love for Christ. Jesus says, I'll know that you, that you love me by the way that you obey my commandments. You see, the true victory over sin comes in this. When you drag sin out of darkness into light and you put it next to the beauty and glory of Jesus, it loses its power because you see it for the hideous nature that it possesses. See, for so many of us, we keep sin this monster and this malady, we tuck it away in the dark corners and recesses of our lives. And there in the darkness, we think that it is some small little monster that we control and we'll make it obey us. And what you don't realize is that monster towers over you and it will destroy you. And so John says, listen, we, we practice this righteousness. And then he comes to the verse. I really want us to focus on this. He says, see or behold, depending on your translation there in chapter 3 and verse 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. I love this little part. And so we are. Spurgeon said we ought to pry into this secret. There is this, this idea, this word carries with it. This is not just like, see, like the glancing look. This is not, see, where it's just like, ah, I give it a little bit of thought here and there. This is stop and be astonished, amazed, excited. Just stop and look. Have you ever had those moments in, in your life where you really stopped to look at something when you were just captured by its beauty? You ever have those things in our house? We, we call them having little moments. And there are, there are times in my house, particularly now, as I have one who will graduate in May and gets ready to go to college. And sometimes it won't be that we're doing anything extraordinary. It may just be that we're having breakfast in the morning, but I'll, I'll be sitting there at the table and I will look at her and all of a sudden it, it causes me just to pause and look and realize my little girl has grown up. It's the thing that, that causes you when you realize I'm getting old and I'm starting to sound like my parents when you're on vacation and all of a sudden you actually stop the car because the beauty of a sunset won't let your eyes pay attention anywhere else. It's the moment when you look at your spouse, the person that you love, and your heart would explode inside of you because you love them more than life itself. John says, that's what I want you to do. I want you to stop. I want you to see. I want you to behold. Stop what you're doing. Look at this. See what kind of love the Father has given us. You see, my dear friends, this is the wonder and scandal an unfathomable riches of the gospel. That the creator would set his affection and his love on a creature who is at enmity and war and rebellion with him and at a cost that would know no limits including the very price of the only begotten himself would set his affection and love on us. Give it freely and unconditionally to a people who didn't even know him, to a people who didn't even care for him. 
John says, you got to stop. This is the kind of thing that your Christian identity, it ought to just make you freeze in your tracks and fall to your knees and in worship erupt. I cannot believe what kind of love God has given me. Our salvation is rooted and grounded in the love between Father and Son and Spirit there in the Godhead. Decreed by the Father, accomplished by the Son, applied by the Spirit. In this eternal God, the love there in the three persons of the Godhead, now that love demonstrated so that we are loved an unconditional, unearned, unmerited, lavish love. And for the person who has repented of their sin and trusted the finished work of Christ, John says, stop whatever you're doing. Just stop and look. Look at the love that the Father's given you. And you stop and you begin to let the weight of that love sink in. And as you are almost crushed beneath something so magnificent and heavy and weighty, then he says, he's given us this love so that we could be called the children of God. And so we are. And I love the way that John uses the word children here. Paul, so often in his writing, he uses the word son, and he wants you to appreciate that legalistic part of, of that understanding and that picture and that metaphor. There is a right standing in our justification, and there is an inheritance that you are guaranteed as a son. But John says, I want you just to stop. I want you to be overwhelmed by the love of God the Father, because you are his child. And when he uses this word, this is more like bearing the family resemblance. My youngest, Simeon, 11. He was in the first service, so I embarrassed him publicly. It was fantastic. It's the job of a parent. Right now, he's sliding around in the soccer field in the rain, excited that he has white on, great to the great discomfort of his mother. My son, uh, people call him my mini-me. And after he got his, his dark rimmed glasses, if you ever see him, you won't have to doubt who he belongs to. He bears the family resemblance. And his name is Simeon Edward Nix. And his name is Simeon Edward Nix because that's the name of his great grandfather. Now, Simeon Edward Nix, his dad is John Edward Nix. His dad is Woodson Edward Nix. His dad was Simeon Edward Nix. His dad was John Edward Nix. And all we can go back is about six generations and then things get weird. <laughs> Say, what's the point? Here's the point. Every time I hear Simeon Edward Nix, I know that's my son. And there is something about looking in that little mirror as he looks back at me. That is my son. And he bears not only the family name, but he bears the name that men in my family have borne for a long time. He is my son. He is my only son. And there is a special thing that happens in my heart and in my mind when somebody calls him, whether it be at school or on a field or when I get to call him down the stairs. And what John is saying to us right here, there's a special love that the Father has for you that you should be given the honor of bearing the family name in the family resemblance. You see, my dear friends, this is the marvel of the gospel. This is why it's so hard for us to get our minds around. Behold, see, stop, and be amazed. God has loved you when there was nothing lovely in you. He has set that love on you. He has at great cost, the cost of his only son, paid the price so that his wrath could be satisfied so that he could make you his own and give you his name, guarantee your inheritance. So we are the children of God. For us in this marvelous truth. He says, listen now, the reason the world doesn't know us is it didn't know him. I need for you to know you're not ever going to be super comfortable in this world because it's not your home. 
This is not home for you. And if you bear the family name and that family is distant, this heavenly kingdom yet to come, I want you to know you may find times of respite, you may find times of ease, but you will never ever be completely satisfied at home here. John said in his gospel, Jesus came into his own, his own, they didn't even recognize him, they didn't even receive him. But to as many as received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children the sons of God. It's a title of honor. He says, you're not gonna be at home here, but I love this. He says, beloved, and I love that tenderness. We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. This imminent return of the king, there is a a hope and a promise for us. This world is not the end for us. This is a vapor. This is a flower that's here for a little while, then gone. Our living here, the truth is, there is something yet to be revealed. There's something yet to come, and there's just enough in Scripture to get us very curious. People ask all the time, what's heaven going to be like? I don't know. I can tell you what the Bible says, but I don't know exactly. How old will I be? I don't know. What will I look like? I don't know. But here's what I do know, Jesus Christ, the first fruits came. And as the guarantee of the life that is to come, 1 Corinthians 15 says that we will be in nature like him and there will be no glass that we look through darkly anymore. We will see him face to face. He had already told Moses, Moses, you can't look at my face and live, but there will be a day when he fits us for heaven at his appearing where we will be glorified, we will be purified, and for the first time in our lives, we will be completely satisfied. There won't be any more sorrow. There won't be any more pain. We'll finally be home. And all these temporary joys and pleasures, the things that we experience here that we thought were so great, will be a distant memory as we taste heaven. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like. But as the Puritan pastor Richard Baxter said, he said, my knowledge of that is small. The eye of faith is dim. But tis enough that Christ knows all. And I shall be like him. Christians are God's children now and forever. So what does that mean? We should be living pure lives because of our hope in Jesus. Look at what he says in verse 3. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself because he is pure. I, I want you to understand, if you belong to Jesus, if you are the children of God, there are certain things that we do to bear that family resemblance. And it's not in our own strength. It is because we have been born again. It is because the Holy Spirit of God has not only freed us from sin's penalty, he's also freed us from sin's power. We don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. One day he's going to free us from its presence. But until that end, here, what do we do? We should live pure and holy lives. A Christian teenager got caught up in the group and they were going to do something that they knew wasn't right. Their conscience was struck and so before the endeavor started, they spoke up and they said, hey, listen, can you just carry me home? Those in the group began to kind of laugh at them. One of them making sport said, "Uh, why are you afraid that your father's going to hurt you if he finds out? And the wisdom from this teenager's mouth went like this. No, I'm not afraid so much that my father will hurt me. I'm afraid that by my actions, how much I'm going to hurt him. You see, our motivation for obedience is not some religious weight that you carry around like a ball and chain. A burden that you cannot bear. We live pure lives because Christ has made us his own. We love Jesus and there is nothing more beautiful and our hope in him is the fuel for sanctification. He says, listen, verse three, everyone who thus hopes in Christ, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm not trusting anything else. I'm just leaning on him. But that hope, That love makes me want to bear the family resemblance and live as he has called me to live. So what do we do about this? First question is this. Are you a child of God? 
Not in the sense that you bear his image, all of us here do. But has there been a moment for you by his gracious act that through the power of the Holy Spirit he has brought conviction, helping you understand that in your sin you have no hope apart from him? Having shown you your sin, acknowledging his holiness and your sinfulness, have you turned away from your sin, renouncing every wicked and evil way, clinging only to Christ, willing to die to everything else to live unto Christ? Is there an increasing love for God, his word, his people? Is there an increasing victory over temptation and sin? Is there love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness, not in perfect measures, but in Increasing measures, is it being demonstrated? Behold, what kind of love the Father gives to those who repent and believe that you can be a child of God and so you would be. This is not a religious thing that I'm asking you to do. Are you a child of God? If you are, then the second thing we talked about is what shall we be? Well, one day we're gonna be like him. Are you living in light of an imminent return? Or is it scarcely a dot on the radar at some point? Do you live as if Jesus could come back today? His return is imminent. It is the fuel. It is our hope. And then when it comes to what should we be, we know none of us are what exactly we should be. Let us make no mistake, we need salvation today just as much as we needed it when the day we were born. But now, in salvation, I was saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. But in that, are you participating with gladness because of this hope and love that you want to bear the family name and represent the family well? There's a reason that at Antioch, people were first called Christians. They sure resembled Christ. In light of this passage in 1 John, I was reminded of Frances Jane Crosby. She was an American aid worker, um, mid 19th century to early 20th century. She was blind. She wrote over 8,000 hymns. And there's one in particular that, in reading this passage, really r resonates with me. It's called Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Behold, what kind of love the Father has given to us. Born born again of his spirit and washed in his blood. But I, I love this third verse. It says, perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness and lost in his love. This blind woman saying, watching and waiting. What's it like if you spend your life in blindness and when the faith becomes sight, the first thing you see is Jesus? Behold, see, look at what kind of love the Father has given to us. We should be called the children of God, and so we are. Are you a child of God? Or are you living in light of Christ's imminent return? And is there a fuel and a fire burning from the hope and love that is found in Christ Jesus so that you bear the family resemblance? If not, I would say this, there's gonna be some people available to pray with you. And if you'd say, John, I, I don't know. I don't know about this God thing, the gospel, this being a Christian, I don't understand. There's some people who would love to pray with you or talk to you about that. If you're dead in your trespasses and sins, I want you to see what kind of love the Father has given to you, that he would make you a son or a daughter. And maybe that you're here and you go, John, as a child, I, it's been difficult. I, I'm struggling, I need somebody to pray with me. There'll be folks available to pray with you for that. It may be that you've been so busy that you need to just stop for just a moment and see, behold, 
what kind of love the Father has given you. And what marvelous truth it is to know that my identity in Christ is that I am a child of God both now and forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.